Matt Schmucker. Let's pray. Do it. Father, you have been kind to us this day already. Your mercies were new in the morning and in the afternoon, and we trust they'll be fresh mm-hmm. to us this evening. We pray, Father, that as we have this conversation, that you would show your favor to us, that our conversation would be edifying. Mm. We would encourage each other and your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Matt Schmucker, welcome to the Room for Nuance podcast. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, How long have we known each other? When did you come to Capitol Hill? 2016, I think. I was an intern at Capitol Hill Baptist Church, so around then. Um, Can I tell my favorite story about you? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you know do I have I, a choice here? yeah <laughs> no you don't you're you're on the show we're gonna do this um you have been accosted by many visitors to chvc right people have tried to like force hugs on you and all kinds of crazy stuff and i'm a big hugger right but i also have this thing uh you know no growing up without a father whatever there are certain times when i see older men and like in my heart i'm just like oh i want you to be my dad oh and you're classifying me as an older man Uh, slightly (laughs) slightly so you were one of the guys uh around chbc and nine marks and that together for the gospel all that stuff which if for people who don't know it's all kind of headquartered together up there on capitol hill where um you were not the walking around with your chest poked out you weren't the most prominent uh, ministerial figure there but I just had this sense about you, like, this is a guy I need to get to know. This is an older brother in the faith that, man, if I can, I'd love to, like, have him pour into me, you know? And so I uh, I saw you in passing one day and kind of sheepishly asked you if I could come up and visit with you at some point. And you tentatively said that I could. You were kind of like, mm, well, mm, okay, <laughs> sure, maybe. Let's see if we can figure it out. So one day I just dropped in on you at the office and again, with a kind of like, oh, okay, well, let's see what this is all about. And uh, and I don't remember what I was asking you about. Some kind of life advice, you know. Uh, and halfway through our conversation, I was just kind of like, man, should I not be here? Like, does Matt not want me to be here? And I just asked you. I just said like, hey, am I bothering you? I'm not trying to do it. And then you very candidly opened up to me and kind of told me that, for a couple of different reasons. People don't always approach you in the best way. Maybe you're the T4G guy and they approach you for those purposes. And I could elaborate, but basically in that moment, when I chose to sort of risk embarrassing myself by opening up emotionally to you, you responded by opening up to me with a level of transparency that just immediately endears you to me. And, uh, and so I think we've been friends ever since. And, um, on top of that, brother, just watching you from a distance, the way that the Lord has used you to advance the gospel in so many different ways, uh, I just am overjoyed to have you on the podcast. I, I do not like it when uh, people, especially in Washington, it's a Washington culture that builds relationships so that they can advance. Right. It's Utilitarian. A, it's a yeah. power thing. Yes. Yeah. If you don't know anybody, if you're not powerful or you don't know powerful people, then I'm not interested in talking to you. And, yeah. and we see that all the time. So I, I, and not that I was powerful, but I had means yeah. through the different projects I worked on that could help people. And, you know, there, there are certain professors and seminaries that only called, called on me yeah. every two years when they needed a, when they needed a free ticket or something. And yeah. I was just like, yeah, I gave it to them every time, but. Wasn't impressed. Yeah. It's kind of like when you get a message on Facebook. Hey, how have you been? We haven't talked in 10 years. And you're like, oh, this is a blast from the past. Hey, 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 Julie from from 12th grade physics. Oh, let's catch up. And then she's like, have you ever wanted to own your own business? <laughs> <laughs> she starts trying to sell you essential oils. Anyways, hey, we've gotten ahead of ourselves. Uh, Tell us a little bit about who you are and why a seminary professor might even want to reach out to you every two years. Uh, foundationally, I was, uh, I start at the beginning, I was raised in a Roman Catholic family. I'm one of mm-hmm. seven sons. I'm number six. Wow. And um, so we, we, it was a 
faithful Roman Catholic family, but it was an unhappy marriage of between my parents generally. Mm-hmm. And, and then with six brothers, it was just a rough and tough house. Mm. Uh, I know I'm skinny, but I learned how to fight pretty early on. Right. Um, and we'll find out after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I also had, there was actually nine children. I had a, an older, the firstborn was a daughter followed by eight sons. Wow. And I'm technically the seventh son. But mm. I always appeared number six in line because I my my sister died and my brother died. It was my mm. sister died before I was married and or before I was born, and my brother died when I was an infant. But I was just talking to someone recently, saying, you know, he said you talk more about death than anybody I know, mm. and I had to think about that, and I realized I think the Lord used the death of my brother and sister yeah. in a positive way, and. I, if you can imagine that. I, mean, I can. I mean, we've got the examples of, you know, Joseph, you know, yeah. his brothers hate him and sell him off, but mm-hmm. good comes from it. Yeah. And I think, I think hearing the stories of my, my parents and my brothers talking about the loss of the siblings yeah. set in inside of me, a desire to about eternity, to, a desire to know if I'm going to heaven. And in our community, I just thought it was a Roman Catholic priest that became, yeah. got in for sure. So I started being mentored in high school and college by priests and nuns. Wow. But it wasn't until my, I also was exposed to the gospel through open air preaching of all things as a sophomore in college and okay. my junior year and my senior year. And it was through that and not finding answers in the Roman Catholic church. So while you're being actively me. discipled by Roman Catholics, yeah. you're hearing some wackadoo out on the street corner. At the, at, on the steps of the undergraduate mm-hmm. library at the University of Maryland, yeah. open air preaching every time, every yeah. noon, noon day. And I, I mocked him that first year. I mocked him the second year, mm-hmm. you know, but he would draw crowds of 100 or 200 kids. Yeah. My senior year, I, I left the Roman Catholic priest for the last time. He was chain smoking, which in the 80s wasn't that unusual, no. but he was hung over, I think, too. Mm-hmm. And his life looked more miserable than even I felt inside. Yeah. And I walked across campus and this guy, this preacher was back again. And he, he, he talked about my insides in a way that he must have known me yeah. about my sin. And the Roman Catholic Church was trying to convince me that I just needed to love myself more, mm. that I was just too hard on myself. In fact, yeah. we changed the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saves a... Wretch. No, it's person because God doesn't make wretches. Mm. And yet on that hot September day in 1984, Pastor Tom talked about our wretchedness inside. Yeah. It was the first time I'd ever heard the explanation. And then he starts talking about Jesus. And then I was like, oh, wait, Jesus isn't just this crucifix ornament, l- lucky charm thing that hangs off our rear view mirror. He's a substitute. And I'd never, I'd never gotten it until that moment. I oh, think man. the Lord opened up my eyes and ears. Contrast creates clarity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, even you think about the scripture, consider your leaders and the outcome of their lives, right? And you had this guy and you said, this is not what I want, mm-hmm. right? Um, Best of all is that he, he, he had us walk forward in a, what I now know to be called an altar call. And he sure. said, he said, I want you to hold hands with the people around you, which was really weird for me. Sure. I don't know any of these people. Yeah. And we sang this song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saves a Wretch Like Me. Oh, man. The guy on my left I was yes. holding hands with was a fellow named John Baker, okay. who then walked me through the gospel for the next six weeks and then introduced me to his sister, who I married three years later. This is the best story ever. <laughs> this is incredible. Um, and praise God for open-air preachers. I, I know. When I see them, a lot of them are, as you say, wackadoo, but... Personally, we yeah. saw a lot of fruit on oh. the campus coming off of that. That was meant to be tongue in cheek. I think a lot of sort of respectable, mm-hmm. res- respectable evangelicals, they feel like of all the ways that you can do gospel ministry, particularly evangelistic gospel ministry, that open air preaching is sort of, they just sort of relegate it to a, a lower tier. Um, uh, as someone who does open air preaching and who's done it for years, uh, I don't find that to be the case. It's certainly difficult soil and you you rarely see the fruit of the seeds that you plant. Mm. It's kind of the way the kingdom works, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Even in our church. So one of our staff members, Russell Berger, he is getting ready to start an open air evangelism and preaching program where he's going to train members of our church to do it. So no, I'm, I'm all in on open air preaching. 
as were the apostles in Jesus. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you went from being a Roman Catholic to being a Christian, praise God. Yeah. Uh, and this was in college. And then what happened? One of the things he said, I can still remember him saying is, why would you wait till you're retired to start giving time to the church? Who, John Piper? No, this, this. Oh, uh, okay. This he said what John Piper said. Evangelist. Okay, all right. Life did exist before John Piper. <sighs> it's hard to believe, man. Hard <laughs> to believe. In the beginning. No, just kidding. And so I, I do think, I, my, and my father was was wealthy, and mm. but he never shared. He was also stingy. Mm. So, uh, and it didn't make him happy. And so I thought there must be something more to life, right? Yeah. And so I just thought, well, I know wealth is not the answer. Yeah. So there what should I give my life to? So I just thought, oh, I'm going to, as best I can, I'm going to see if I can give it to the gospel. Um, and there were fits and starts. We were saved into a good church, um, but that church fell in love with the seeker sensitive <coughs> movement back in the eighties. Sorry. When you say we were saved into a good church. Well, that, that there was a whole college group that gotcha. were together. And then I eventually married, married my wife and we were all, we were all part of the same church, but I fell in yeah. love with the seeker sensitive movement, dumbed down the gospel. It was all yeah. theotainment. And we're right. like, we got to start over. Yeah. So we went at that time, I was working for Ford Motor Credit Company in business. And I, we hiked it back in Dallas and we hiked it back to DC. My father unexpectedly died. And my, um, my wife's father was ill and her grandmother died. We just felt like, we're in this church that's dumb now. Even though we're young Christians, we recognized it. Right. And we hike it back to DC and we joined my wife's grandmother's church, Capitol Hill Baptist Church. This is in the days of Carl Henry, pre marked ever. Carl F. H. Henry was there. Um, my wife's grandmother was a member there from 1924 till her death in 1990, 66 years. Incredible. Um, and what her, a legacy of faith. Her parents were married there in 1946. Her dad was baptized there under. John Compton Ball. Yeah, if you remember Dick Compton, Compton Ball's picture, that oil, the only oil painting in our building. Um, yeah, so that I was planning on going to grad school. I had that summer off. Mm -hmm. I was pretty discouraged about Christianity. I just thought the only, now I've been in two true churches, the Catholic church and then this other church that was supposed to be a true church. But I was like, what do I have to do to find a real church that yeah, looks like right. the Bible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... The past, Mark's predecessor was preaching from a reformed perspective, which I had never, I did not know what that was. Yeah. Um, and he introduced me to writers like Packer and Lloyd Jones and others, uh, which I'm grateful for. And he hired me that summer to kind of clean up their finances at Capitol Hill. Okay. And at the end of that summer, he said, will you stay for a year, you know, and help me try to turn this thing around? Because the church was a broken, it was a, it was a mess. It's 50 years of nothing but decline. Yeah. Failed, failed ministers. They were down to a couple hundred senior citizens. I mean, we were the youngest by 40 years. Yeah. What year was this? 1991. Okay. Uh, so I talked to my wife. We prayed about it. We said, well, here we are five blocks from the Capitol. There's this great building. There's this, <coughs> they own all this property, these residences. Let's see if we can help turn this thing around. Yeah. At the end of that year, that minister disqualified himself in a very mm. heinous public way. And then the old men in the church came to me and said, will you stay until we find a new pastor? Well, I didn't know how long that could take. It ended up taking two years. Right. And here you are thinking, okay, this isn't the best church, but it's better than the last two experiences I've had. And then this pastor goes and disqualifies himself. I mean, you're just... We're a reverse witness yeah. in this community. Yeah. Because of the way he disqualified himself, we, we, we had no money to keep the properties up. Mm. It was just a disgrace of yeah. the way our properties looked. But I'm even just thinking for you personally, I mean, I mean, the, <clears throat> Lord, the Lord must have really been sustaining you because you kind of were just jumping out of one frying pan into the fire again and again and again. At least, well, from that perspective at that time, the Lord had bigger plans. My unbelieving older brothers thought I was nuts. Yeah. Why was I giving my... my early years to a broken down Baptist church. Right. And honestly, I thought I was nuts at times right after we finally <laughs> got that pastor out and off. He lived on the block. I lived right next door to him. We got him out. Then my house was broken into and ransacked. I caught the guy in my home. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he had kicked in the doors and I'm like, what on earth is going on? What and are we doing? My wife and two little kids at the time stayed out of the city with her parents until I could get the doors fixed and locked up again. 
And when I brought her back in to the city and we finally got the kids down, we went to bed ourselves and at nighttime it's dark. We're in bed and she's tearful and she says, what are we doing here? Yeah. And this is going to sound terribly inspirational now. I guess it was inspired, but I simply said, I think we're here for the people who will come. And I think, and, and, and I didn't even know all that that meant, but right. I, I did not feel liberty to leave. I felt a kind of protectiveness of the, the place. I felt, I, but, but that was tested. I mean, I remember shortly after that, then the, we were walking, I'm walking out the front door of my house. We're right there five blocks behind the Capitol. We're just, everybody who was young that came to the church previously left. I mean, it was just, it was just, there was nothing cool about the place. In, inner city church planting was not hip yet. Right. You know, you got to think Rick Warren and Bill Hybels are at the height of their power right. out in Chicago and California. There's right. nothing hipster going on in the city. Right. I mean, our houses are broken into, our cars are ransacked constantly. And I walked out the front door of, the, of my house to go over to the little market across the street. And I, ran, I was behind by a couple of yards, two homosexual men who were in my neighborhood who I knew and I had witnessed to, and they were mocking my church for what had happened under, under the previous pastor, mm. publicly, loudly mocking my church. And I just thought, man, they are right. And we've got to turn this around mm. somehow. And so we just began to pray and see, Lord, bring us a faithful man who would, who would love you, would love the gospel, want to live here in the city, would give decades to help build this church and a witness here. Wow. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now you can't agree with that, <laughs> <laughs> but it's in there for a reason. Okay. So, you know, since we're doing this, let's just continue to recount this story until we get to the, to present day. Let, let, let that be the bulk of the episode, if it will. So you pray the search committee it starts looking, looking, looking. We got a hundred resumes mm. in almost right away. Okay. And one of them was Mark E. Dever. And I look at this resume and I'm, and people were the, the pulpit committee, mind and you. Carl Henry solicited that resume from him. Carl knew Mark. He, uh, from Southern Seminary, Carl did a J term down there yep. and Mark took him and two week course, got to know him. Um, but I looked at this. So the pulpit committee, which is made up of 70 and 80 year olds are excited because anything Carl recommends is, you know, goes right to the top of the pile. Right. But I looked at this resume and I thought, man, we don't, <coughs> we need a pastor. We don't need a brain. Right. Because all that resume said was school, 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 school. Mm -hmm. And I, I left that meeting pretty discouraged. And I walk home and there's a young lady visiting my wife and she says, you know who you need as a pastor? I said, please tell me who. She goes, Mark Dever. I said, how do you know that? Yeah. That name. He said, oh, he discipled my brother was when he was down in Louisville doing seminary. I said, really? Tell me about him. She goes, oh, he's really friendly. He loves people. He's an evangelist. I mean, she said, the resume she filled out was the opposite of what was showing on paper. Right. And so then I got interested in it. Uh, he showed up, he showed up um, really out of deference to Carl. He was coming to the States to teach a two-week Puritan course at uh, Beeson Divinity School. And then he was going over to see Al Moeller, who was in his first week as the president of Southern Seminary. And he said, I'll stop for the weekend in between. Yeah. And he was planning on going to Southern. That was the to next step. To be a step. church history professor. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and Al told him to stay 100 feet away. <laughs> from at, at least 100 feet. <laughs> yeah. And Al was right. Yeah. Based on history. Yeah. And Al needed him at Southern Seminary because mm -hmm. that he needed support. And Mark spent a long weekend with us. And I, that Monday morning when I was driving him to the airport, he looked off to the right there on 395 as you look onto the Capitol building. And he said, I think the Lord has moved my heart here. And I nearly drove off the side of the road and killed us both right there. Yeah, Cause you were thinking, what? No way this guy's gonna. Well, he quickly became my friend, you know, Mark. And in, in a yeah. weekend, you, he, you can become his friend. And, He's like and, Velcro. Yeah. And, and I'm looking at him. You know, and I'm evaluating with him Southern Seminary or stay in Cambridge. They yeah. were happy in Cambridge. Their right. son was born there. Their daughter was happy there. He had a fruitful ministry there. It's an intellectual crossroads. Yeah. S -s Brother, stay there. He's teaching at the university. He's the associate pastor under one, even men who like D.A. Carson thought was one of the best preachers on the planet. It's like, 
Why would you leave a fruitful ministry like that? And then why, why would you come to Capitol Hill? Right. There's no guarantee. No. But this is that subjective sense that sure. he had, a yeah. call. Yeah. So now uh, this is all great, but this isn't Mark's story. This is your story. So tell us what happened next. Well, he said, Through you're not going to go lives. anywhere, are you? And I was like, man, I never thought I was going to live in the city in a, right. in a, with a dinky yard and or no yard effectively doing the administration as a Southern Baptist. And there was not, and we were, and we were making $30,000 a year and we had to pay for our own health care. It was just, yeah, we were pulling money out of savings to be there. I mean, there was nothing that said, there's a lot of hope and potential here. Yeah. <laughs> but I stayed and I thought, I'll just get him settled in. Yeah. And then it turned into 1994, 1995, 1996. Mm-hmm. In 1997, and, and then I and pulled, you're serving as a church administrator, yep. basically throughout. This. this is your main job. It's my main job. Okay, and then I then I said enough's enough, and I quit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. And I went back into the into finance. Okay, and made a six figure job. You know, had a six figure job. Had an office down by the White House. Uh, was there for a year. Yeah, I thought it was what I was going to uh, always was going to do. Yeah, and then that's when I realized what we were doing back there was more important than I was giving credit to. And I, uh, I didn't want to go back to that job, but that's when I went back. The, the guy who hired me, who was, who was the head of this firm, Mark and I had been witnessing to him and, and he wanted to, he, he was very intrigued with what was happening at the church. He had lived in that neighborhood for a long time and he saw that there was something different going on there, there that there was a difference in the people. Yeah. And he wanted us, he, he, this guy had done a PhD in early American history at Yale and, and he saw the- This is just a guy from the neighborhood. Yeah. He yeah. saw the fruit of like a Jonathan Edwards and the Great Awakening. And he thought, is, could this be something like that? So he liked the cultural or societal effects of what mm-hmm. was happening. And he said, if you could replicate these kind of churches, maybe we'd see some good come right. out of it. He's, he's looking just it's, through a sociological lens. Uh, uh, th- yeah. Cause uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So pretty soon after I started working for him, he said, you know, why don't you start an organization? And I was like, Hey, I just got out of there. I've just mm-hmm. spent six hard years there and they were spiritually hard years. Yeah. I was like, I'm tired. I'm broke. I, no, I'm not going back there. By the church revitalization is brutal. <laughs> it's brutal. I, don't, I don't recommend it to the week for the week. I was recently, sorry, real quick. I was recently talking to Mark about it and he said, well, brother, why don't you go revitalize another church? I said, Mark, I, I don't have another one in me, brother. You know? <laughs> okay. So anyways, at the end of the first year of working for him, he was saying, he was pitching me a couple of projects that I could work on. And I said, what, what about that organization where we try to help revitalize churches? He said, do you want to do that? Oh, so this is the unbeliever who suggested yeah. this. Okay. And I said, I think so. I said, I'd have to talk to Mark about it. You know, this is, you know, this is something new. He said, well, talk to Mark. And he said, I'll give you $100,000 a year for the first three years. See if you can get it off the ground. Incredible. And so nine marks was invented by a pagan. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So I came back in 98. God's providence. And started nine marks in my back bedroom. Was Mark immediately keen to it? No. He was, no, he was nervous about it. Uh, in part because of our relationship, funnily enough. Mark's and right. mine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, our, one of the reasons I left was it was, it was, I mean, Mark does, Mark's this huge extrovert and I'm an introvert mm-hmm. and there weren't a lot of people around. Mark was not known in America. There were not a lot of people around. And so I was kind of overwhelmed and tired and my dealing with that was to kind of retreat. Right. And then, you know, well, that doesn't work for him. Right. So yeah. it put a strain on our relationship. We loved each other. We were elders together. Useful in ministry. Yeah, but it was hard. Yeah. I, when I went to bed at night, it was, I put my head down against his Calvin section in his study. I mean, we were, we were in each other's hip pockets. Right. And it was intense and it was seven days a week. Right. And it was just, I was burnt out. There yeah. was no doubt about it. So you, did you have to persuade Mark? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Okay, so the year is? 1998. And Nine Marks, a.k.a. the Center for Church Reform. That's how it started. Get started. Because that was the donor's idea. 
Okay. All right. And hey, listen, that's not a bad name, <laughs> you know, but we can it get- caused two problems. Okay. One. Uh, some people thought of it as like, we're trying to convince people to be reformed soteriology. Makes sense. And I was like, no, that's not actually what we're trying to do. Although we are, but anyway. <laughs> True. Number two, it implied change, which we were about. Yeah. But churches don't like to change. so Nobody if, likes to be told that you need to reform. Correct. Right. So after working it for about three years, I said, you know, all we really want to do is talk about the nine marks, right? Right. Right. Let's just change it to nine marks. Okay. And we did. So the first three years or first five years, what, tell us about those early days at Nine Marks. I mean, certainly very wild, wild west, I, I imagine, right? Just trying to put all the pieces together, making a bunch of mistakes. <clears throat> we basically only had one product and that was uh, Mark had written nine articles for, for nine different newsletters at the church that I said, hey, these are pretty good. We should put them in a little booklet. This was yeah. before Nine Marks got started. I have, a, I have one of the original <laughs> printings down in my office. And we decided, let's try to print that and get it out to seminaries, to all the <laughs> seminaries. Who printed that? Initially, Founders Conference did. Yeah. And then we took the copyrights back and we printed it ourselves. Okay. And we distributed up to like 100,000 of those things. Whoa. I was lugging boxes and boxes and boxes of these booklets to every yeah. seminary we could Get, get them out. So that's to. where you were get primarily seminaries. Were you taking them to conferences and stuff like that? Nope. No, there's just, just seminaries. seminaries. Okay. And were you trying to get in with professors? Like, hey, give these away, bookstores, what? Uh, we'd try everything and anything. Okay. This, right. Yeah. If we get if, it into the hands of future pastors. That's right. Okay. Um, and then Crossway came along and they said, <laughs> they, the acquisitions guy back then took Mark and I to lunch at Union Station. He said, I keep see, running into this little booklet you know, mm. Mark, why don't you write a larger book? And Mark says, well, I don't write books. And they said, well, why don't yeah. you do nine sermons and then cobble it together in a book? And that was the beginning of Nine Marks of Holy Church book. That was right. our second product. Okay. But otherwise, the other thing that we started was a guy from Southern Seminary called up and said, I want to bring 10 guys in a van to your church because this is like Jurassic Park. Dinosaurs really do live. Yeah. We want to- Do you know who that guy is? I do. Can you tell me? It's okay if you can't. You at least have to tell me later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a sad story what's happened to okay, me. Okay, well, never mind then. Um, but still later. So he, he then, so he came up and they had a wonderful time and then they left and a couple months later he calls up and says, do you, let's do this again. I'll bring 10 more guys. I was like, this sounds like a program you're building. He said, yeah, let's call it a weekender. Mm. Well, now we've had two or 3,000 men through that weekender program now. Yeah. Um, and good fruits come from that. That was kind of our third product. Product. Yeah. But my the best thing I ever did was hire Jonathan Lehman because he was the one who really got things rolling on the publishing side of things. Can you elaborate on that? What, what do you mean? Oh, you know, Mark is not a writer. Mm -hmm. um, he he's gr he's a great mouthpiece. He's a great hood ornament. But you you know <laughs> you know that's all. That's what I think when I think. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I think of hood. So he's he can really. Yeah. So yeah. he's just great on his feet. He's great building relationships. He doesn't like to write, but we need someone to take these ideas, put them in writing. And we yeah. need to be able to reach the pew and the pulpit. Yeah. So Jonathan was really the backbone behind that. The best thing I ever did was just keep Jonathan employed, raise enough money to keep him employed. Uh, I one time was asking Mark about various aspects of nine marks and you know how a conversation like that can go. And I said, you know, who, who's the one person besides yourself that you think nine marks can't do without in typical mark fashion he said well first of all brother you just exclude me from the list nine marks doesn't need me right and i'm like okay right and he says honestly jonathan mm -hmm. lehman you know yeah when i left when we hired uh ryan townsend to take over the executive director job from nine marks which is what you were doing which is what i was doing okay. i said to ryan you've got two jobs <clears throat> keep mark interested and jonathan employed mm. and you'll be fine okay and he's done that so far, 11 years now. He has, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, you hire Ryan. He comes and takes over your position. That was 2011. 2011. And then Before you didn't really the, give us any really good stories, by the way. I mean, that was cool, but like I was hoping for like, and we did this and it blew up in our face. And But you know, back to Mark's, if thinking about Mark's, this is kind of life at Capitol Hill Baptist Church. Mark's installation as the pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist it, it, we had a baby that week. Yeah. Our third child was born. Yeah. And then, then three or four days later, we're hosting all these people coming in for his installation. And I've got 
Timothy George, the dean of the Beeson Divinity School, staying at my house. I've got R. Albert Muller Jr., the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, staying at my house. And I've got D.A. Carson at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, staying at my house. Yeah. And that that life just kept going like that. Yeah. Busy and really interesting and fascinating and exhausting. Right. Okay. So uh, you transitioned from executive director to? Well, no, because I, so 1998, I was executive director. Uh, 2006, we started T4G. Well, that's a big difference. What, what happened between 1998 and 2006? I was chairman of the elders at Capitol Hill Baptist Church. I was running nine marks and then we started T4G. So you, okay. So you weren't the executive director, but you were still doing nine No, I was so. the executive director. Okay, sorry, you uh, timeline. I'm all screwed up. So you hired Ryan in 2000. Not till 2011. I hired him because uh, I was I was doing too many things. Okay, I'll stop asking questions and just let you keep going, <laughs> man, because I'm messing this all up. Okay, so 2006, you start T4G. Yep. Yeah, but I mean, the idea probably didn't strike you in 2006, did it? The idea of T4G. When did you start percolating? When did you start thinking, ah, oh, we should maybe try our hand at something? We had talked about maybe nine marks doing something, um, some sort of conference. And nobody, TGC had not been birthed yet. Okay. Um, nobody was out there really doing anything apart from, you know, MacArthur, Sproul, and Yeah, Ligonier Piper. Conference, yeah. The, those Shepherd's three things, they all conference. tended to be smaller and... And certainly regional. Yeah. Very Florida, much. Minneapolis. Still pretty much is. California. Days, yeah. Especially after COVID. So I'm, I talked about this idea with Mark. Mark, I claim that, I claim that it was Mark and I talking about doing something. Mark claims that it was him sitting with CJ Mahaney, Ligon Duncan, and Al Moeller when they talked about yeah. putting something together. But nonetheless, we said, they came back and said, can you help us organize this conference? Okay. So we, that was in 2004, 2005. And okay. we, our first one was 2006. We did not know. Mark, without the other three's knowledge, went and invited Piper, MacArthur, and Sproul. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And they all accepted. Yeah. And all of a sudden we were, when we advertised that, all of a sudden we were sold out. We, had, we only had 2,800 seats in that sweaty ballroom of the gold house yeah. hotel in Louisville, Kentucky. Sweaty ball room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was packed out. It was sweaty and it was super fun. Yeah. And it was, were you there? No, but I wish I could have been. It was, it was so much fun. Yeah. And it was just. Well, it's it, kind of like anything, right? Like when your church grows, a lot of people just pine for those good old days when it was just 50 people and you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyways. It was it was great to have this kind of younger generation of up and coming reformed Baptist reformed leaders sitting with their their kind of spiritual mentors. Yeah, but okay, so you were essentially running nine marks. You don't know how to plan a conference. How did you? How were you able to put this thing together? Uh, I the Sovereign Grace guys were a huge help. Okay, uh, Paul Medler in particular was a huge help. So what I missed, he would pick up. Yeah. And he and I worked on that conference all the way up through like 2014, 2016. He yeah. was a part of his, my left hand and right hand. Let's talk about conferences for a minute. Okay. The conference culture in American evangelicalism is, is kind of a problem. Uh, maybe you already know what I mean, but I'll just elaborate, right? A lot of people sort of live from conference to conference, right? So a lot of pastors do that. It's kind of like what puts wind in their sails. And then on top of that, you ha you have the celebrity culture that it can, uh, it's like this mutually reinforcing cycle, right? It helps constitute it and then it reinforces it and then it just goes bigger and bigger. Um, we could we could talk a lot more about like the, the some of the problems with c conference culture in American evangelicalism. But were you aware of that? Were you, were you guys intentionally thinking like, okay, if we're going to do this, we have to make sure that we don't do it like this, but rather we do it like this so that it's not carnal, but using the wisdom, not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of the Lord. Was there any kind of intentionality there? I mean, if you go to the very opening 
welcome. In 2006, the inaugural conference at T4G, Mark says, I unashamedly invited these other men That's right, to yeah. get you here. That's right. Because you all love to hear them preach, and so do we. And we wanted to have a conversation with them. Mm. So he's, he's, it's not, he has said many times, it's not how he would build a church. Okay. So he, he deliberately tamps down his personality in his own pulpit. Very true. Uh, but when it comes to conference, he feels more freedom. Uh, but there were some distinctives that he really wanted to push. He wanted to push singing. Uh, and he wanted to push a particular kind of singing. Right. Uh, he wanted to have conversations. He wanted to, he wanted to do what he enjoys doing, hear good preaching, and then sit around and talk about that preaching. Yeah. So everybody does panels now and this and that, but it, nobody was doing that quite like we started in 2006. Yeah. And it was a blast. And I think you learned a lot. He also wanted to give away a lot of books. We, we had Another spent, thing that he loves to do. Yeah. And we spent millions of dollars giving away books. Over which, the years. Over the years. Yeah. Which... You don't do that if you're in the conference business. Yeah. That's dumb. Right. <laughs> Why would you give a portion of every registrant back his money in books? But yeah. Mark wanted to introduce to generations of pastors, good writers and good books. And so these were, it, we were often offered, hey, give, here's this latest, greatest book. And Mark would just reject it. He said, I, I don't want to give the latest book. I want to give okay. old, solid, good stuff. Yeah. So we gave away. Packers knowing God. Well, doesn't everybody have that? That's fine, Matt. If everybody does have that, they'll have a second copy and they can just give it away again. Yes. You know, so yeah, there's dozens and dozens of books we gave away. Any any regrets over the years on books that were given away? You're like, ah, I don't know if we should have given that one out. Not off the top of my head. Anyone that you wish would have made it into the to the giveaway pile that never <laughs> <To Mars>? did? <laughs> hey, come on. That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> There were some bullets that we dodged. Okay. I got to hear about it. Oh, there, there are a lot, there's lots of pressure on us to include certain hot rod reform guys. Hot um, rod reform guys. And, and those we, who know. We did not <laughs> bite and, yeah. um, and we took some heat for that. Yeah. And we, we were ultimately proven right. As Justified it turned in the out. end. Yeah. That's one of the things about Mark and, and the kind of non Mark's uh, T4, all of that. It's just, yeah, I'm not really worried about this pressure that you're going to try to apply to me. I'm just going to do what I think is right for the Lord. And trust it's probably him. the best thing I've learned from Mark is just, he believes the best about people and he has no fear of man. Yeah. That's a good combination for a pastor. It's massive. Yeah. Believe the best and don't have any fear of man. Yeah. You can really, you can really do some damage. You can go far <laughs> with that. Yeah. 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 And he has. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when you first started after that first year, right? T4G madness, right? Utter madness. In the first year, probably cra craziest of all. Did you think we got something? Like the Lord is really going to bless this. Can't wait to do this again in another two years. Or were you like, whew, glad that's over with. The Lord used it, but on to the next thing. We did. We, we had no plan after coming out of that conference. We had no plan. We did not have another room lined up. We did, we, we just, we're just doing this one thing. Yeah. And then we got together afterwards and said, that was fun. Yeah. This was fruitful. Should we do it again? And then we started, do you do it every year? Do you do it every other year? Like, don't do it every year. You know, it's just this is every other year. I was like, yeah. Fine. That's because I'm, I'm still running nine marks. I'm right. still the elder. Right. You know, yeah. I've, got, I've got a growing family. So it's fine. Every other year is plenty. Yeah. So we, rent, we rented a bigger facility and it doubled the next time. Yeah. And then we eventually rented more facilities and it kept doubling. And it's like, wow. We, yeah, it was, it was, I was, I was very excited about it. Not just because of introducing the various speakers to generations. Remember, like if you have 10,000 people there, there on average, there was a thought between a thousand and 2000 of those guys were seminarians. So you're, Mm. You're introducing people to to not just these speakers, but to the authors. Like, like if right. you if you pull your average twenty year old seminarian, they probably won't know who James Montgomery Boyce is, right? Let alone D. Martin Lloyd, D. Martin Lloyd Jones or Packer or somebody mm -hmm. else. Let alone Spurgeon and yeah, you know. Um, and that's Edwards. changing by God's grace, largely mm -hmm. in light of things like T four G. T four G. I mean, Banner of Truth. I mean, the, the, we could so we would push hard, good publishers. Yeah, and so it it just 
it was like a time release capsule implanting yeah. into this next generation right. of like, yeah. just just read these writers. Yeah. Don't listen to us. Read these writers. Even the carefully cultivated bookstore, which is something that people weren't really a doing. A ton of work. I mean, and just funneling people into that room, giving them steep discounts, just another way of getting good books into the hands of people who desperately need them. And that came, that curated bookstore came because we'd walk into other faithful conferences and we'd see bad books. Right, because the publishers- Are pushing right. them. And yeah. like, and so- Mark hated it every time I'd hand him a list of like 3,000 titles. Yeah. I said, and he goes, people don't know this, that he would have to review. He'd have to go through every one mm -hmm. of them yeah. and he'd just strike, strike, strike. And then the publishers would push back on us and it's like, look, we, and we'd say to the, the bookstore operators, like, if you don't want to run this bookstore the way we're going to run it, then we won't have it. We don't care that much. Right. So, yeah. but these are the books that we, we want to push. These are in the same way that we curated those who were coming to do the exhibits. Right. And we, curated we, the songs. We and, didn't yeah. want bad exhibitors. We wanted to commend these exhibitors, these publishers, these missions agencies. Right. We wanted to commend the books. Not just whoever can pay the money. It's not, a, yeah, it's just it had nothing to do with money. And yeah. yet it's funny. You take care of the faithful side of it and, and the, the money, money comes along. Yeah. Did you guys ever take a loss financially? Not on T4G. Okay. We'll come back to on, on other things. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you on conferences. Yes, on conferences. Yeah, I want to ask you a few more questions about T4G. You tell me if my question is too forthright or if you just can't discuss it. No okay. pressure. Okay. So uh, over the years, there have been there's been a rotation of speakers, mm -hmm. right? There's kind of always been like a core, but even even for a while, some people that were thought to be core were uh, not invited or dis disinvited or couldn't make it and. Other new guys were added and the, some of those new guys didn't come back. And you know how it is on the internet. Lots of uh, sinful speculation, curiosity. Uh, can you speak to any of that process? I know a little bit about it, but uh, I think I think a lot of people are curious. You know, is it just like politics behind the scene or like why does a guy end up not being there after having been there for five years? Oh, there's different reasons for different guys. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that was true when, when we were still what I call together for the gospel, when it was still Mahaney, Moeller, Duncan, Dever. Okay. All four had to be in agreement on, on, all, the other on all the other speakers. Okay. So everybody had a veto. Yeah. And, and, and it, <coughs> a veto would carry. Not a vote, a veto. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, there were some, there were some guys who were never invited because one guy just couldn't, yeah. couldn't do it. Yeah. Mark probably had the, like, if, if you're running Southern Seminary or RTS, you've, you've got to think, especially Southern Seminary, you've got to think almost, you have to think politically. You're just, you're representing 40,000 churches. <laughs> and so Al had more pressure on him than Mark. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean the mess with that came down on Sovereign Grace and CJ. Right. Um, I'll, I've, I've never said this publicly, but uh, I, you will never convince me that CJ Mahaney would do anything personally or allow his church to do anything that would hurt a child. Mm. Period. Full stop. Yeah. And I think what happened to him was a shame, and it was the first in our circles that was kind of the first cancel. Um, I, I also don't, how many times did I hear where there's smoke, there's fire? And I, I think a Christian, I don't think can say that because there was Certainly smoke around Paul and there was smoke around Jesus and there was smoke around everybody that we. That's you know, faithful. Yeah. That's faithful. Yeah. And so uh, I don't, I don't buy that either. Yeah. So I think he, I think, when I think when CJ stepped away, we we lost a lot of the joy. I think yeah. in T4G. Yeah. Uh, regarding new speakers, uh, I think one of the coolest things about the last year was how many new speakers they were, there were, and how good they were. Right. I mean, a lot of the classics were missing. <laughs> no MacArthur, no Sproul. You know, he went to go be with the Lord, so on and so forth. But. I mean, shy. I mean, 
a lot of Greg Gilbert knocked it. I know he was supposed to be there the, at the one before, but it was COVID. That doesn't count, you know, yeah. online, blah, blah, blah. But they crushed it. And I think it was a really fitting way to end T4G to say like, the gospel is moving on, you know, yeah. R.C. Sproul is not with us, but Shylin is. And, and he's preaching the same gospel with just as much fire and fervency and passion and holiness as, as R.C. Sproul would more than happily sort of pass the baton on uh, to that next generation. That was my but impression. But then you have this sober, godly, quiet Sinclair Ferguson yes. for the first time. Yes. <laughs> Brothers, yeah, <laughs> it's just like, oh, just read the back of a shampoo bottle to me. I don't even care what you're saying. Just keep talking. Yeah, yeah. I think the last, the last one, 2022, is a reflection really of just Mark and Lig's heart. They just, you don't, you don't, you don't have to consider what CJ wanted or Al wanted. Now it's just the two of them, and they said, well, it's the last one. Let's just do yeah. this. This is what we're gonna do. Yeah. If anybody wants to come along, so be it. When did Kevin DeYoung join? What year? He was actually at the first conference. Right. Matt Chandler, Kevin DeYoung, and David Platt were all in the audience at, in 2006. Nobody okay. knew who they were. Wow. Um, we bought Kevin's, uh, somebody sent us Kevin's book, Why We're Not Emergent. Mark read it before it was published and said, this is really good. We should give this away at, at T4G, the very first T4G. And that suddenly we kind of became a bit of a rocket ship for Kevin. Yeah. Okay. And I think then he either was, there in 08 or 10. I can't yeah. remember. But he joined shortly after that and just yeah. became a regular and a, wow, just a pillar yeah. in those meetings. Those speaker meetings are, when we would have dinner and stuff, it's pretty wild to watch all those guys <laughs> together. Yeah. So you were, well, people don't know that, you know, it's not like these guys just show up in Louisville, right? There's a lot of planning in the two-year interim. One conference ends, the next day, you're already thinking about the year or two years later, right? Well, it was together for the gospel. They, they, these just weren't the latest and greatest. Let's pull these guys together for, for fly in, fly out. The requirements were if you're, if you, you've been asked to speak, you have to be there the entire time. Right. You have to participate in all the speaker meals. Yeah. And, and that means every lunch and every dinner. You also, in the off years, you have to go on retreat with each other yep. for three days. Yep. And they would, and they loved it. And you would be there for those. I would be there for about half of it. Okay. You got any good stories? I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a sobering story. Okay. There was, a, a, again, one of these rock star reformed young guys. Um, he had not fallen away yet. And there was one night we were all having dinner and they were talking about this man and his understanding of grace. So that would be the speakers at the retreat. We're talking about this guy. Okay. Yeah. Who was kind of, in the larger reformed evangelical circles, not particularly ours, but in larger reformed. Yeah, right. And it, the discussion went on. It felt like for half an hour, 45 minutes about this young man. And I just thought, I thought, here are these godly guys with so much faithfulness and track record and fruitfulness. If he could be a fly on the wall hearing about the warning would he, would he heed? Hmm. Well, I know different people tried to get to him, but he didn't heed and he wrecked his life, hmm. including his family. And it was really sobering to be there uh, and, and, and listen to that. Yeah. Wow. Well, anytime something like that happens, I personally just take it as a, you know, you were talking about the death of your siblings. It's kind of like, from your first days, this ingrained memento mori, right? Like remember death. That's from the earliest days of your life, you've had that impressed upon you. Uh, whenever I see a brother pastor fall, I just take that as a reminder. It could be you. You only stand by God's grace alone. Listen to the voice of wise brothers around you. You know, love correction. And uh, yeah, that is a very sobering story. Not the fun story I was hoping for. I was hoping for like a classic John Piper witticism. <laughs> but but speaking of behind the scenes and, and, and knowing these guys behind the scenes, um, you know, over the years, I've been in one form of ministry or another for a long time, not as long as you, but uh, you get to know guys and it can be a real bummer, right? You get to know a guy and who they are behind the scenes it's just discouraging, you know? 
Um, one of the things I love about Nine Marks, and I'm not saying this is unique to Nine Marks. I'm just saying this is where most of my world and, and ministerial fellowship is, is that the deeper I go with these guys, the more I see that this is just who they are. You know, I find more love, more godliness, more, you know, everything. Uh, what was it like being with these, you know, re- reformed celebrities, right? <laughs> Big fish in a small pond, but being with these guys behind the scenes for so many years. I mean, what was there a lot of like, and, uh, and, and, and two cubes, not three. If there's three cubes, I send it back, you know, was, or were they who they seem to be? Uh, yeah, they, they are. I, I think you, you get, most of them are pastors. So I think it's kind of hard to hide that. Mm. Um, I, 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 it grieves me to, to think there's division between John MacArthur and some, some, some of our guys, camp, yeah. but he was nothing but ever a gentleman. Yeah. Uh, and everything that you see on the stage, you see in person. Yeah. Well, I, I, last time I talked with Mark, uh, John came up and he said, I just got off the phone with John yesterday. We talked about his grandkids and, you know, so even where there may be some like ministerial f- different impulses and philosophy of ministry, maybe there's less public partnership now. It's not like John and Mark are enemies. Yeah, the, inter- the internet thinks that John and Mark hate each other, right. but they talk to each other a lot. They love each other yeah. dearly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lig and Duncan is just so charitable. Yeah. Uh, CJ is always fun. C- you know, CJ, CJ pastors the room. Mm. You know, he can't help himself. Right, right. <laughs> um, you got to love guys like that. It is funny. Like when when Chandler and Platt and DeYoung kind of first got into the speaker meetings, they kind of n- knew they, they should just keep keep the head down. Yeah. You know, and like, it's... You told me a great David Platt story one time. They were, ch- you guys were planning something. And uh, you said that David was just sitting in the corner, sort of like talking under his breath. And you asked him and he said, oh, I'm just sitting here praying. I hope no one asks me any questions. <laughs> I don't want to have to say anything. I just trust you brothers, <laughs> which seems typical of stories I've heard about his humility. Yeah. Yeah. If only he wasn't woke. No. <laughs> <laughs> I per the say, discernment I blogs. <laughs> per the discernment blogs. Um, yeah. He is what you get. I mean, yeah. that, that guy, you, you know, you can, uh, you know, the internet can say what it wants to about him. But, you know, when I have lunch with David, uh, I walk away from that lunch thinking, I think, I think he must have seen Jesus in his prayer this mm. morning, his prayer time this morning in his closet. Jeez. Like, and I don't feel that way about a lot of guys. Right. Yeah. But there's there's a nearness that I would mm. love to mimic. I, I and know exactly. produce an aroma. <laughs> yeah. Yes. If only I could just rub him and then rub it on myself. No, <laughs> communing with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you well, also- and then the guy, you know. My son-in-law uh, and daughter just adopted, and you know, oh, congrats, David man. twins. <laughs> and nice. you know, David remembers these things, and he's pr- and he's praying about them. And I was like, wait, you pastor like ten thousand people yeah. over there, and you're yeah. you're all over the world, and yet you remember us over here. Yeah. Like, that's remarkable. That's that's the incredible. pastor's heart. Yeah. I still don't know the names of most of the children and <laughs> most of the families. <laughs> I'm like, all right, we got Ricky, Dicky, Timmy, Tommy. Uh, you t- you had told me another great story one time. Maybe you can't tell it as well as you did uh, the first time you told it to me, but about how like John Piper is just as serious about everything all the time. <laughs> Remember the French fry story? <laughs> I do remember the French Can you story. tell the French fries? We were at the cross conference. And, okay. Uh, we were at the, at a, in a private dining yeah. room because okay. um, otherwise these guys would not be able to eat right. unless you were yeah. cloistered off. And yeah. I don't like doing that, but nonetheless, they need to eat and yeah. have discussion. And uh, this, this uh, the guy who's waiting on us is trying to push his way through two doors <laughs> while juggling plates of food in both hands. And John across the table yells, are those fries? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was like, yes. He goes, right here. <laughs> like he's preaching. <laughs> like he was preaching. Uh, he's calling down the thunder of the fries right here. It was so funny. It was <laughs> yeah. so funny. Did you see that thing on where his, 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 uh, it just was out 
on the internet recently. Someone sent his it to eye me. His watch. His eye watch yes. goes off. Yeah. And it says, have you fallen? Yeah. Did you see that? I saw it. It was great. It was so funny. I, I was having a conversation with someone recently and they were saying like, oh, Piper's got a great sense of humor. I was like, false. I mean, that doesn't mean he can't conceptualize things that are funny, but more often than not, he just says things and it just is funny because it's Piper, you know? Yeah, he's through the through our the cross conference. Um, he's become a dear friend and supporter in a way that few have been. Yeah, and he loves that conference. And well, can we pause that because yeah. I want to come to the cross conference. Okay. Let me put a a bow on T four G. I could ask you a thousand more questions, but um, one thing, if you could go back and change it about T four G. That's the negative. The, ne- the positive question is going to be, what do you think the most enduring legacy and the most fru- fruitful legacy of T4G will be? But let's start with, if you could go back, n- not what should Mark Dever change, right? Not right, but like you, Matt Schmucker, thinking about the influence you've had, the decisions you've made, what, what might you change? What I would change? I mean, I yeah. would say, like, uh, I would protect CJ in the sense of like, I okay. wish that didn't happen. Sure. Like, he was so... He was so important, I think. Yeah. Um, but anything like, even like logistically, administratively, other decisions that were made, and there may not be anything. Yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, we we walked away from everyone. Every time our team would get together afterwards and we would think, okay, we could do these 12 things better and we would try okay. to improve them the next yeah. time. But no, I think the, the city worked well. Um, the location, I think one of the reasons it was successful uh, was it was regional. There was nothing going on in that region. Yeah. And um, Louisville is so equidistant. To- it's, they claim it's six hours, uh, within a six hour drive of 60% of the nation's yeah. population. So yeah. it was, that was one of the reasons it was successful. I think we hit the reformed wave at the right time or we're part of Very creating true. the reformed wave at the right time. Yeah. But but we're standing on the backs of <coughs> men right. who labored for so many years when we were still in high school and college. But it does, it does, I mean, tactically, and I mean this in the least carnal, most godly, like, you know, working for the advancement of the kingdom sense of the word, tactically, there's a big difference between a bunch of guys sort of doing their own thing and then sort of them uniting their resources, right? I mean, that's why Southern Baptists have the cooperative, right? We believe we can do more together. Yeah. And to have all these reform guys from across such a broad spectrum come together like that, pretty incredible. And it's also taxing. Yeah. And that tax usually was taken out of Mark's side to try to keep everybody together. Right. I don't think people understand this about Mark because he is a fundamentalist in the best sense of the word. I mean, one of the books he has us read in the internship is a, basically a book against big tent evangelicalism, right? Uh, Ian Murray's Evangelicalism Divided. But he is one of the most ecumenical uh, people I've ever met. That's another thing that I try to imitate with him. But it's not a fraudulent, superficial, shallow ecumenicalism, you know? Ecumenis- ecumenicism. I always mess that word up. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So taxing. Yeah. Yeah, he would always walk away from those retreats exhausted. I'm sure. Uh, what is? What do you think will be the most enduring fruit? I think the thing that will be missed will be okay. the re- the relationships. It was like a family reunion every two years. And now, do you mean that for you and for no, the guys? You I, mean for everyone? I yeah, for everyone. Yeah. We Mark was just. I walked into an elders meeting just two weeks ago. And Mark and I were the first guys there. And he goes, I want to talk to you about T4G. I said, what about? <laughs> you shut that thing down. Yeah. He's like, everywhere I go, people are saying, where should I go now? Mm. Insert Kevin DeYoung's new conference. <laughs> Coram yeah. Dale. Yeah. It's a, it's, yeah, it's a good conference. Um, so I think that, I, I think it's important, especially if you're kind of an independent Baptist kind of, you know, we're not Presbyterians. So Presbyterians are, are well connected. They have it built into the polity. Structure. Into the polity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we 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 are often independent, and our natures tend to be that way. So it's it's good to be able to come together periodically yeah. as a tribe. Yeah, and do good stuff. Uh, towards the end, it actually became a little bit of a problem for you guys. Like 
guys would go to the conference and they would skip out on like half of the plenary sessions because they would just be hanging out. And oh. it's not bad. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I don't know if you knew this, <laughs> I but <can't> imagine. <laughs> uh, I, I would feel torn. Guys would be like, oh, just come hang with me. And I'm like, but I feel like I should be. That's why we never announced who the next speaker was. It, it forced you to show up first before. That you- was a very radical, bold <laughs> strategy. And I hated it. <laughs> It's like going to a CrossFit gym when they don't tell you what the workout's going to be. You're just going to show up and like, I hope it's not crazy, you know? Yeah, uh, it was good. Pilates. <laughs> yeah, we're doing Pilates today, yeah. Um, why, did, why did T4G end? And were you on board with it or did you think it should have kept going? I was on board with it. Um, so you killed T4G. You put it down like a dirty dog. Uh, Mark would tell you that he did, but the truth is when Al pulled out, uh, last year, uh, the in the last year, twenty twenty one, for various reasons, it was just down to Lig and Mark. Uh, I called of the original four of the original yeah. four. Um, Al called me, and then I called Mark, who was in England, and I called uh, Lig, who was in Charlotte or someplace, Jackson, and told him, and. Uh, Mark and I, Mark was in England for about a week. And so we went back and forth about what are we going to do? Uh, what do we want to do? And I said, brother, w- do you want to shut this thing down? He said, uh, I'm 75% of the way there. Mm-hmm. And I never said anything to him, but I went back to my team and I said, we're shutting this down. Mm. Let's just, let's get the thing in place. And then we'll show Lig and Mark what we do. And I presented it and they said, great. Yeah. And we rejigged, we reset our invitations, we re, we changed what the what the yeah, conference theme, was going to yeah, be, the theme. Yeah. You feel good about it? Yeah. Uh, I'm a big believer in shutting things down. Put 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 the dog down when it needs to. Uh, yeah. you know, what, what's the what's the quote? Every every cause starts out as a mission, turns into a business, ends up as a racket. Oh. And I did not want to be yeah. s- sitting here holding the end of something that should have been put to death. So I like that we had a strong finish and a good run yeah. in, in general. Uh, kind of like Seinfeld ending at its peak, right? Just Not like Seinfeld. It, exactly like Seinfeld. Just I a was bunch thinking of all Jews in the in family. New York. <laughs> I was thinking all <laughs> yeah. in the family. Or Same thing, Gomer's right? pile, Gomer pile. <laughs> but I mean, like I'm a huge fan of The Office and they ended on a very low, I mean, after- Too just, late. Too, oh, wait. And a lot of shows are like that. And a lot of- Athletes and and artists are like that. Because there's I mean, money to be made. There's money to be made. NBC is going to pay dependent. you ten million dollars an episode right. to come back. But Mark and the rest of those guys in no way need T4G. It was good. It was useful for a time. How many were there? How many? Uh, how many T4G events were there? Six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 9. twenty, twenty-two, nine. Very good. Get that <laughs> nine. Uh, I mean, if you just stop and think about the impact of the singing alone at mm. T4G, I remember before I went the first year, <clears throat> everyone was like, the singing, the singing. And I'm a classic guy. I, I, at this point, I'm, I'm a classic young reform guy. I'm like the preaching, right? Like, and it wasn't even like a celebrity thing. It was just like, I, I just want good preaching, right? And singing, I was a guy in church, you know, Praise God for just barely. I just, I didn't have a, a good theology of singing. And so I'm, I'm in there. We're getting ready to get started. Bob Coughlin starts playing. And all of a sudden, 10,000. I just start crying. 10,000 guys just start. I think we, I don't remember what we started with. Whatever it was, it was, everyone went from zero to a hundred immediately. Mm-hmm. And I was, I started crying. I couldn't sing. And I just, I remember sitting there thinking like, this is going to be like heaven. And like, and then to even stop and think about like, this is nothing compared to what heaven's going to be. Uh, and I can tell you 15 stories from other guys who had that same experience, which is really like you said about T4G and overflow of what Mark just likes to do anyways. Mm-hmm. We had a guy at our church who I could not get on board with congregational singing. Mm-hmm. I sent him to a weekender, call me. First thing he did was call me. He was like, I'm in, mm-hmm. right? So even just the impact, I mean, so anyways, all that to say, praise God for T4G, the Lord used it. I think a lot of people have been very cynical in the way that they've assessed the end of T4G. 
Uh, you said you were together for the, yeah, sorry, real quick, before I move on to the cross conference, what would you say to someone who says together for the gospel until things get hard and then you disband? What would you say to a criticism like that? Uh, that perhaps the church is more reflective of the culture than we would like to think we are. Mm. It's a very uh, honest answer. That there's more division than we would like to think. And I can't help but go to 1 Corinthians 1 and heed Paul's warning about division. Mm. And well, that there's also n- later in 1 Corinthians, he says, and there must be division among you. Mm. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I don't, it, it, it appears even in our circles that there is not a laboring to be of one mind anymore. Okay. There's a laboring yeah. to actually figure out why I can't be with you. Right. There's I just no assume, charity. I just assume that we can't be together. Yeah. Yeah. Paul says, uh, eagerly strive to maintain the unity of the spirit. And that word is strive is like fight. And it's just Paul knew, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that it's not never going to be easy. And people aren't willing to fight for it, at least as, as it doesn't feel like as much right now. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it says be of one mind. Mm. Like that means that, that I have to work toward that. You, yeah. you've, you know that with your wife, you know that with your children, you know mm-hmm. that with your own local church. Well, now how much harder is that with 10,000 people in the room? Right. Are we still together for the gospel? I am. I, I'm, I'm happy with the project. I, I, I find it nothing. I only have warm feelings about it. And, and look, I would have seen the underside of it more than anybody else. Yeah. And I'm um, thankful to the Lord that he gave us the opportunity. I learned a lot. It was a lot of work, uh, but, but I'm thankful for it. I think, yeah, I, th- I think the charitable spirit that you saw on that platform w- was a marked difference f- from what we see today mm. on the internet. One of the things that I told Mark that when I saw him after the last conference was about our Healthy Church Collective mm-hmm. um, here in, in Decatur, well, Decatur Huntsville area. So on Tuesday, there were 35 uh, pastors and aspiring pastors in the room together just from our area here. And one of the first things that I told them in our first meeting is, you know, there's no more together for the gospel, but we are together for the gospel, you know, and just trying to locally, you know, just, you know, it's similar to what people say about government. You know, you're focusing so much on federal stuff that you forget that there are subsidiarity, right? There's, there's levels, right? And so my impulse after leaving the last T4G was just to say, I'm just going to come back and do this where I am. I don't know what's going to happen nationally. Well, it ended up Kevin DeYoung started the kind of next iteration of, of those uh, reformed T4G-esque conferences. But even if that wouldn't have happened, I can do that here, you know? Um, and so we are, and I think it's going really well. So uh, I think we are together for the gospel. And uh, in the context of church history, I, I, this isn't even a blip on the radar, I don't think. No. Yeah. Let's talk about the cross conference. Yep. You, were, you said, oh, T4G. I, I, this work is so fulfilling and so easy. I want to <laughs> do another one. <laughs> What year did you, uh, first of all, was cross conference your idea? And I'm not asking you so you can brag. I'm just, no, genuinely. no, it wasn't. Um, okay. We were, it was years at T4G in speaker meetings, lamenting the state of student missions. Yeah. Without naming names. But can you elaborate without saying name or say a name, whatever. <laughs> but can you elaborate on, on what the lament there is? Like the, 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 so John Piper went to, a certain conference in the 1960s. Yeah. Um, some of these other guys went to the same conference years later. They kind of cut their missions teeth at that missions conference. Yeah. But that was when it was faithful. <laughs> but now the same year that they opened the, their conference in 2019 on the same day that we opened the cross conference, yeah. they had, they had welcomed uh, native Americans onto their platform in their opening session and apologize for trespassing on their land in St. Louis. Ah, the land acknowledgement. And ask them to lead in prayer to the feather gods. Brother, this so is that's so, how the conference started. Right. This is so dangerous. I think you should say the name. Urbana. Yeah. 
I mean, listen, hundreds of thousands of college students are going to have this advertised to them. They should know that this stuff is dangerous and these people are false teachers. Not saying that every person involved or anything like that, but it's bad. It's dangerous. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, 2008, 2010 at T4G, this conversation is going on. And then 2012, the conversation is going on again in different speaker meetings. And at the very last session, we're almost done with T4G 2012. There's 12,000 people behind me and Mark leans over to me because we always sit beside each other because we're basically running that conference. He leans right. over and he goes, he goes, uh, as soon as we close here, a couple of us are going into a meeting to talk about a new student missions conference. Do you want to join me? And I said, no. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I've got 12,000 people behind me and I've got to shut down this show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so... So I got a call a month later from Kevin DeYoung and he was asking me a bunch of questions about the possibility of what would it take and this and that and who would I look to to hire? And I said, well, you really want to be careful who you hire because, you know, they're, every guy's going to bring their own personality. Some guys are kind of big show guys. Some guys are more modest. Yeah. So long story short, Piper said, let's gather a group in the fall of 2012. Let's gather in the fall of of 2012, let's gather a group up in Minneapolis and Platt was there and DeYoung was there, um, myself, uh, Zane Pratt, Max Stiles, a few others. And let's talk about seeing about <coughs> pulling together a new student missions conference. Wow. And that was, and John came ready. He had a statement of faith ready. Mm. He even had a name. It was, <laughs> 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 it was a cross. Uh, a C R O S S. But cross emphasized, right? <laughs> like, go, so go across, right? Cr across a border. I can even see him and, doing those hand yeah. gestures. We're going <laughs> across. <laughs> so we came back and thought about it. Like, how about just cross? Dude, he was only one letter off. That's not bad <laughs> no, for a first pass. I was grateful yeah. for it. He was so excited about it. And, and where I respect, John so much is when he talks about sorrowful yet always rejoicing, that's John. Mm. Whether it's on the stage or in at when ordering fries, you know, it's, and he wanted no silliness. He said this, he wanted blood earnest. Praise God. Preaching. Yeah. And, and he wanted a spirit of. Work. Silliness won't sustain you on the mission field. <laughs> no, no. You know, when I had, uh, when I was laying there, thought my bones were breaking with dengue fever. You know, I didn't need flippancy. I needed something deeper than that. And the examples could be multiplied. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was, it was a, the first conference we had in 2013. Uh, this great teaching. It lasted for four, four or five days. It was like, they wow. wanted this long conference. Yeah. It's not it that was, long now. No, okay. it's a three day conference now. <clears throat> and uh, did you guys figure that out the first year? Like we can't keep doing. We this. cut it by a day, and okay. now we're cutting it by a day again. So it must have been five days the first time, okay, and then four, three. and now we're going to three. Okay, um, it was too long for the the students too. Right? Yeah, <laughs> ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> it was long, yeah. um, but it's great teaching, wonderful experience, and we lost two hundred fifty thousand dollars first year. Yeah, man, and. So what do you do with that? Well, we said, surely we can do better the next time. Yeah. And then the may, next- May I ask like, what was the, like, where, we, where, we, <laughs> where was the hemorrhage? Well, we, f we assumed there was going to be more in attendance and it, we had 3,200. You're thinking we're leveraging this platform we already have, these networks. Yeah. Um, some had predicted that we'd have 10,000 people there. I said, if we, if we get past three, we'd be fortunate. Okay. And we got to 3,200, but okay. we, we budgeted as if we were going to have 10,000. <laughs> Similar to T4G giving books away and... Not as many, but yeah. Okay. Um, but we said, let's do it again. So we did it again in 2016, I guess. And we lost another $250,000. Mm. And my board is looking at me sideways now saying, how many times can you lose money and stay in business? Yeah. <laughs> And I said, what are you, the U.S. government? <laughs> <laughs> uh, bazinga. All right, go ahead. So I said, I said to the board, give me one more shot. You can shut, if I lose again, you can shut it down. Now lose at all? I mean, is there like a threshold? Mm. Can you go from 250 loss <laughs> to like 50? I just knew, here, here's what I knew. I knew 
I didn't realize when we started it that everything was going to fall onto me and my desk. Yeah. So I was listening to a lot of other voices that wanted things. Once I figured out all the bills were showing up on my desk, I kind of said, okay, well, I'm going to run the budget then. Yeah. And I cleaned, and you are a cleaned some master. things up yeah. and we didn't invite 60 people from the Middle East and, you know, all that transportation. Yeah. And, yeah. and we made some money. We actually got the, oper- the thing back into the black. Wow. Um, hey, you want to run for... Some president, somebody, I don't know. <laughs> so, but the most important thing, and, and 7,200 people showed up. Wow. And, and so we did, a, we'd made a number of changes and it was fruitful. But the most important thing, of course, is it's incumbent on my generation to build something for that age group. They're not, they don't know how to do it. They don't, they don't have the money. They don't have the funding. They don't have anything. We've got to build a faithful thing. We can't depend on somebody else. And when we looked around, we didn't see anything that was filling that particular gap. Right. And the, the, so has there been three so far? Uh, four, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah. COVID and whatnot. Right. But, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the thing we've learned though, was these students are coming out of uh, unchurched backgrounds. They're, they're biblically illiterate. I, every passing generation is kind of getting more illiterate right. when it comes to the Bible. So we now have a kind of a quiet process where we start with the gospel, <coughs> centralize the church in their minds, and then talk about missions. Praise God. So we, we, we yeah. at first we went right for missions. Right. And we were talking to a you lot of kids who too did much. not. Uh, we were, and we now know there are dozens of kids who make professions. And the, re- the really fun part is we know of hundreds and hundreds of people who have gone back and joined churches. We hear yes. from the pastors. Yes. Um, but let's not send, and we try to slow down the, the go side. We want them to go. Yeah. But let's not send a 22-year-old who's messing around with porn yeah. and wouldn't qualify to be an elder in a, a church here in the States right. to go do missions and plant churches. Right. He doesn't even know what a church is. Right. So go back to your church, learn to be discipled, start discipling slows the process down. So last night we just prayed over as our own, our own elders just prayed over a guy and his wife who went to cross 2013. And so 10 years later, he's now gone through seminary. He's gone through the internship at Capitol Hill. He's been preparing he fundraising. And now he's ready to go. Oh, praise and, God. Like, and he's still a young man. Yeah. Right. But I think that I have some confidence that he could actually go and stick. Mm. Whereas most missionaries go and don't make it through their first Term. Yeah, three to five years. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I'm, I'm tempted to so go we're down. Big, we're big. We, we are big on not just going, but on sending. Because 99% of those people in that room are not going to go. Right. Okay. So, so, but the Great Commission wasn't just given to a few. Right. So we push hard on what it means to be a sender, a faithful sender. And you can be involved in missions right here in Decatur, Alabama. Right. And I, I, you know, I really saw that for the first time. I visited a church in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Yeah, I, that, I'm forgetting that, the name. That, Jeff Noblet's church, yes. right? Yeah. Second, I want to say Second Baptist. I don't, I don't remember. But you walk into that building, you can't help but get the sense that this church in the middle of, to me, living in Washington, well, D.C., right, feels yeah. like the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Muscle Shoals, Alabama, they had such a great commission worldview. I was like, there's no such thing as a non-strategic place. Yeah. It's oh, all strategic. You better believe it. Yeah. I mean, it's, technology has helped with that. Uh, yeah, I, we could riff on that for a little bit. One of the things that I love about the cross conference is the centrality of the local church. Was that part of the vision from the very beginning? No. Okay. Well, I mean, yes, but but it's become more. Okay. Because Jesus. <laughs> we just kept reading our Bibles and we were like, yeah, this is probably good. I mean, we're sending these young people to plant churches, but right. they're not a part of a church. They're right. not a part of a healthy church. So you just needed some real time data. You needed to like get to know the people who were coming to this conference before you realized where we're going to really emphasize. And yeah. Uh, what has been uh, the most significant fruit that you've seen thus far from cross, or is it too soon to make an evaluation like that? I mean, there's been four years, kind of three, four conferences. Uh, yeah. uh, I actually enjoy that conference more than even T4G. Yeah. I, the energy in the room, you get 7,000, 18 to 25 year olds. Yeah. 
And that's because that's who it's aimed at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the energy in that room, the singing is just as glorious. Yeah. Um, I was. But because it's full of young people, do you have like a. You can really move the needle in that age group. You know. Oh, I was I, about to make a stupid joke. I'm glad you cut me a off. 50, a 50 year old. Okay. Maybe he'll get a new book and maybe he'll be encouraged. But. Yeah. But an 18 year old, uh, you could really reset the trajectory of his life, yeah. you know, with the right teaching and the right book and the Absolutely. right exposure. Like these kids have never seen this and it's pretty exciting. And I, you know, we decided we would last, last time we gathered in 22, we split up, we did breakouts and we said, okay, if you're serious, serious, serious about missions, we want you to go over to this room. And okay. if you're kind of younger, I haven't thought about, we want you to go into this discipleship track. And in that discipleship track, we actually had a talk on LGBTQ issues. Okay. These college students are dealing with this all the time, right? Ubiquitous. This, we asked this brother to give a, a talk on this. He gave a great talk. It was careful. It was, past, it was pastoral. And we allowed time for Q&A. And the line just stacks up. Like all of a sudden there's 40 or 50 people in the line. And in my heart, I said, here comes the snark. Right. I thought we're going to get pounded now. Yeah. And instead what I saw was careful, thoughtful young people concerned about their neighbors, loving their neighbors. Yeah. I was, I was undone by those questions. I was looking around throughout that conference and young people are taking notes. Yeah. They're thoroughly engaged. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I I was, I, I was like, nothing, nothing that the internet shows you about that age group was mm -hmm. in that room right. for those three days. It right. it was quite hopeful and inspiring. Yeah, yeah. And it made me excited about getting ready for the next one. Love hopes all things. Mm -hmm. Now, did you did you do cross because you like and believe in conferences or and or? Did you do cross because your heart is really heavily focused on missions? Uh, conferences are insufficient. I would always take a local church over a conference. Amen. Um, but they can, they can help. Mm -hmm. So did you see it as, a, I mean, was it like you were thinking more about missions or the same amount, but passionately about missions and you thought, you know what? I'll, I'll jump on this. I'll, I'll jump in here because I really think the Lord can use this in the same way that he used T4G. I think he can use this for missions. Was that your mindset from the beginning? Uh, I don't, sad to my, <laughs> lack of credit here. I, I, I don't think a lot about missions, not enough about missions. I don't oh, think. Mm, okay. um, and, but I know people who do think a lot about it. Yeah. And I thought if these guys think that me organizing a conference can help, yeah. then I'll do that. And so it's hard to organize a conference. It's hard it's to get the money hard. together. Yeah. It takes a long time. It's a lot of, it's just, a, I mean, if you looked at my last week, a good chunk of it was spent on food. Right. <laughs> How do you feed 7,000 or yeah. 10,000 kids in two hours? Yeah. It, you wouldn't believe how much time I spend on food and how expensive it is. Uh, real quick, just a point of correction. You said you don't really think a lot about missions. I'm sure that that's relative. Um, but you are really heavily engaged with trying to reform some mission practices. Uh, and the, we don't have to elaborate on that at length, but, um, from my perspective, brother, you not only think a lot about missions, but you think about missions well, and I see you giving your life to advance the cause of the great commission. So take that. I, I, I still would say I don't think about missions. There are particular people on the mission field that sure. I think are doing excellent work that I want to support. Yeah. And if that means all I have to do is raise money in America to fund them to do this excellent work, yeah. then that's, I get the easy side of missions, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't even have to leave America. Yeah. But if that can multiply their work, then yeah. I'm, I'm in. Okay, so let's talk about that real quick. Whether we're talking about planning food for college students or fundraising, uh, you are very administratively gifted. And oftentimes when we think about the spiritual- Isn't everybody? <laughs> Luke, am I administratively gifted? <laughs> Luke said no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> I literally couldn't remember what time you were supposed to get in today. <laughs> if it wasn't for Luke, you'd be stranded at the airport. I was the last time I came I, here. You remember? No need to bring that up. No need to bring that up. Uh, uh, and listen, we're not going to talk about everything that I want to talk about today. It's just not possible. Um, so we'll have to bring you back down again to do a part two. But uh, what, what would you say to a brother who who just, when he thinks about spiritual gifts and he sees this person has the, you know, like we all have a, a, a sort of plethora of gifts, but this guy is a great evangelist and this guy's an amazing preacher and all I have kind of in the Eeyore voice is just oh, the gift of administration. You know, I mean, what encouragement would you have in light of your experience and what the Lord has very graciously allowed you to do with your administrative gifts to that brother who may be, or sister who may be sort of looking down on their administrative gifts? Be willing to set aside your favorite gift to exercise for the benefit of the church. Okay. Now, now riff on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Well, my, I have the gift of singing in the yeah. choir. I do solos. Well, what if the church doesn't have a choir? And okay. They need- well, I guess what I mean is I just, it, it, I mean, uh, when you, we, from the earliest days, right? What you did at CHBC, yeah. by God's grace, you were the guy who, you were the forerunner to Mark and Mark had different gifts than you. Yeah. But without your gifts, that revitalization would not have been able to take place. Of course, with God, all things are possible, but you get what I'm saying. The Without, last guy just died who would still call on me when the toilets were broken at Capitol Hill Baptist Church. Yeah. He lived to be 103. Yes. I've lived with this for so long. Oh, <laughs> man. And uh, and I'm, I know you're going to miss him. But I, I, the lo- point is, I is love admission. Get- I love administration. Yeah. I, I discovered that at church. Yeah. Like, oh, there's this thing called administration. Is it, I just assumed everybody was could organize things. It's desperately needed. But when I would get called on to preach and teach, and I still do, you're going to preach for us this Sunday. You're a great teacher. Lord willing. I, but I just like, I, once it's done, I skip back to my job. Right. I right. skip. Yeah. I'm like, I'm so glad that's done. Yeah. The exact opposite for me. Whenever I get to <laughs> preach or teach or d- do a discipleship lunch or whatever, I'm just like, oh, I could do this all day. And then I come back and Luke says, hey, we need to do this. And I'm like, ah, oh, do we though? <laughs> uh but the, the problem is okay. that with, if you have if you have administrative gifts, the world rewards you for those, uh, and the church okay. doesn't. Well, brother, I want to honor you. That's, that's what, not that's what, what that's, I'm looking but for. But I know, but that's why I'm bringing this up, but though, because money, I want to change. There's that. money to be left. There's you're leaving money on the table, right? If 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 you come into the church and you're administratively gifted, and yet the church needs that. There oh, is. I see. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying you can make more money out in the world. Yeah. You think about somebody like Jamie Dunlop. One of the associate pastors. Took a CHPC. huge pay cut took to come be the executive pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist. I see what you're saying. And and has left a lot of money on the table. Uh, but the church needs those sorts of gifts. It's listed there with healing and preaching and teaching there in in First Corinthians, right? Yeah. Or Second Corinthians. Uh, Just say Corinthians, man. <laughs> Corinthians. Say with boldness. Um, Paul says. So you, yeah, if you've, you just have to be, yeah, you have yeah. to, you have to make the calculation is, one of my brothers said to me, who came to know the Lord late in life, and, so, and it was through his volunteer work at T4G, but he said to me one time, we were, we were out in front of our church, and he said, he said, all I have is a pile of money, and, but you've helped build this stuff. Yeah. And, and it was kind of my Joseph moment, one of my older brothers kind of, you know, saying, saying this to me. But, I marveled as much as he did at what the Lord had done. Yeah. You know, this broken down Baptist church. We didn't even have signs on the outside of the building. It was so broken down. Do you not have signs? We You're looking sign. at Luke. Luke, you need really need to get signs up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I know you said you weren't looking for me to honor you, but I, I, I want to honor you as a way of honoring anyone who may be watching this or listening to this, <laughs> who, uh, who has that gift. I mean, I just... Like to use Luke as an example, I mean, I am administratively a disaster. By God's grace, I try to get better with it, but can a Jaguar change his spots, right? That kind of a thing. And uh, I just, I just, I've seen the fruit of people who are administratively gifted and what it can do to free up people who aren't uh, to serve the church better with the giftings that they do have. And it is a huge gift. And in, in heaven, it will be, uh, the fruit of that will be seen more clearly. Okay, here's a word to your people. Okay. Those of you who are in the first chair at the local church. Okay, hit me. 
it's not too hard. There are, there are to be in that administrative role is automatically to be at least in the second chair. Okay. And there are those second chair guys can have leadership qualities that don't get exploited. Okay. They're always having to give in to the preferences of the first chair guy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a mistake. So how do you avoid I think it? the first chair guys need to recognize, <laughs> first of all, the humility of the men who are taking the second chair. Right. And then give them opportunity to lead. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Thank you, brother. Um, that's never going to happen with me. <laughs> I'm never going to do that, but that's good advice for someone else. Um, uh, one more question that's serious. And then a couple of rapid fire questions, which also are serious, but, uh, you, you, before you explained to me sitting in your office, um, the difference between settlers and pioneers in ministry. Do you remember that yeah. illustration? I found it profoundly helpful. I've come back to it. I've told it like it's my own story <laughs> and my own analogy. <laughs> Can you can you walk us through that? I haven't used that for a long time, um, so maybe not. Uh, yeah, there. I've seen some guys who went out for church planting, church planting, or revitalization, and they couldn't get it done. Mm-hmm. They were more settler. If they if it was built, they could run it. They yeah. could they could get it done, but they they couldn't see nothing and make it something. Right. Um, so one Whereas, of the reasons why I was not, I'm not the executive director of nine marks is I get antsy. I want to rearrange the furniture. I want to go build something. And so yeah. I want to start something new. And there are lots of guys behind me who are willing to settle yeah. and, and keep it going and growing. And you need those kind of guys. Yeah. But I, I don't think I'm one of them. I think there's a lot of wisdom and knowing kind of how you're built and not to say that you never need, I mean, you, you can't just go, jump from one thing to another for the rest of your life without wisdom and discernment and go, I'm a pioneer, you know, yeah. and you can't be lazy and afraid to blaze a trail and have some kind of creativity and entrepreneurial spirit because I'm a settler. Nevertheless, to understand sort of the way that the Lord has built you um, can give you a, a lot of peace and joy and guidance uh, for your wisdom trajectory. So I found that helpful. I just wanted to share Drives that. my wife crazy. She's yeah. like, why would you leave this? You just got it built. Yeah. Uh, feel antsy. Yeah. My wife redoes the living room every six months. It looked great. <laughs> why, why, why are there chickens in my living room now? I don't understand. <laughs> why are there chickens all over the wall? Anyways, here, here are the best questions. Uh, I, you don't I have think. any notes. What do you just memorize all your questions here? Or? Oh man, dude, you're just so easy to chat with. Is there something behind? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, this this will reveal a lot about how your character. much of an odd couple are you and I? Oh, the best, <laughs> the best. I mean, we could not be any more. We couldn't be. We, we talk now. about this every time we hang out. We have a blast. To my like, embarrassment, because I think I I saw this muscle bound cool hair tattoo guys show up at yeah. lifting weights on our church parking lot. And I was like, what did Mark drag in? Yeah. I would literally and I be out there doing you for a long time. Yeah, I know. And your I wife was it. out there lifting more than I could. She still does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a great picture that we still have. I, I'm going to frame it and put it in my office. It's I'm in the parking lot. I got 225 pounds on the bar. I'm doing a clean and jerk. And there are a row of 15 CHBC, you know, deep, deep Hacks daughters out there, <laughs> you know, uh, my kids, some of the intern kids, and they're all just like, like, I didn't do that. They just did that. And then somebody took the picture right when I was doing it. So those were the days, man. I brought a van full of weight equipment and I would just open up the back door and get my workout in, in the parking lot. I know. I'd look from my <laughs> office. I looked down there and I was like, what on earth? Yeah. Um, this is going to reveal a lot about your character. So think, 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 brother, before you answer this question. There are going to be literally dozens of people watching this. Stare, stare right into the camera. <laughs> yes. What is your least favorite candy? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you mine. It's black licorice. Ooh, that's a good I couldn't one. eat. I, I'll gag. If I even smell it, I'm puking. Can't do it. I have no idea. No least favorite. Like... Circus peanuts. 
Uh, the fact that you don't have a strong opinion about this says a lot about your. I don't. I don't eat any of that stuff. You don't eat candy, so you don't have a favorite candy. I can tell you, I liked hundred thousand dollar bars when I was a kid. Are those hundred grand bars? Something like. Well, they used to be called hundred thousand. Okay, no, I think they're just hundred grand. <laughs> and I grew up right next to Hershey's. Oh, so we were big Hershey's eaters. Okay, but now you don't eat sugar. Can yeah, that's a bummer. Um, okay, uh, favorite book outside of the Bible. Ooh. Ugh. Uh, I th- I'm, I always put a caveat on these things because okay. they they tend to hit you at particular times. It's very true. That's why it's, it's very so true. Reading um, reading uh, Arnold Dalimore's two volumes on George Whitfield. Yeah. Uh, Thirty years ago, introduced me to Reformed. Theology. Yeah. Wow. Okay. What a unique introduction. Yeah. yeah. But that's where I went. Oh. Yeah. Um, Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp introduced me to a very different idea of what parenting looks like. Mm-hmm. Gospel application rather than behavior modification. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing you preach about that this Sunday. What are you reading right now? Uh, <laughs> the Exile of Eve. Or is it the Exile of Eve? Or is it even, even Exile? exile even Exile. You know, Fant- it? it's a fantastic book. She's a punchy writer, Re- she, Rebecca Merkel. She's Douglas Wilson's daughter. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I see. I know her as Ben Merkel's wife. Right. And uh, the punchiness in the writing now makes ah, a lot more sense, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, we give. I've given that book to several women in our church, uh, and one sister in particular who was kind of struggling with the difficulty of being raised as a woman in America and then coming to terms with what the scripture calls for. She read that book and she just, she hasn't been the same since mm. in her outlook, you know? I also like, uh, I just finished um, Habits of the Household. Yeah. We're imposing a liturgy on good, the family life. Yeah. Good, good practical things to do if yeah. you struggle as a dad to kind of start instilling, filling the home with the aroma of Christ. Yeah. I'm halfway through Piper's Providence book. Ooh, are you, what are you just doing like I'm five just or doing ten a few pages, pages a day. Yeah. And it, there, it, there's enough there, right. just a few pages every yeah. once in a while. It's like a Puritan. You just cannot read a lot at no. one time. So is it, uh, is it everything you were hoping it's, it would be? It's very good. Yeah. It's very challenging. Ch- challenging and like it's dense, like reading John Owen no, or challenging? No, no, no. it's friendlier than that. But challenging in the sense that like, oh, the bigness of God is blowing my mind right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm reading through uh, and then being satisfied and content in the midst of trials mm. and seeing good. You know yeah. this this idea that the Christian John doesn't quite say it this way, but the Christian is always walking toward good. Yeah, Romans eight twenty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's I'm walking with a brother in our church right now. Through he's not in our church, visiting, considering joining walking with him through reformed theology stuff. And he keeps wanting to go conceptual on me, which is fine. You can do that. We have to do that at some point, right? And he, he keeps unpacking the potential philosophical implications of what this might mean. And, and I'm, just, I'm just like, hey, listen, one day, like if your kid dies, right? This matters. This, this, we can have debates about the extent of the freeness of the human will, right? But like, that's, I'm trying to get you to see what you just described, right? Like God is sovereign over our suffering, over our trials. He's working for our joy. He's working for our glory. Get that. And then we'll figure all this other stuff out later, you know? Well, brother, I think that's the end. Uh, I have more questions, more rapid fire questions, but actually we have a dinner date with some brothers from my church. I'm going to be making tacos. So it's going to be a good time. And so we need to wrap it up. Uh, Can I pray with you before we end? I dare you to say no. (laughs) Father God, um, we asked for your grace at the beginning of this episode and we feel like we've received it. Lord, we pray that those who are watching us will interpret us through the most charitable lens possible. We understand that we do not speak uh, 100% truth 100% of the time. Uh, Only you can do that. We are doing our very best to honor you with our words and with our discussion. And so uh, we pray that if there's been any error uh, in this conversation, mm-hmm. that you'll protect our listeners from it. Yes. But if there's been anything good, Lord, we pray that you'll, you'll amplify it in their hearts and minds. 
Uh, We pray that you will draw special attention to it and that you will use this episode uh, for the glory of your name, for the for the building up of the church, for the salvation of your elect among the nations. And we pray that you'll bless Matt as he goes back into uh, the field to continue laboring. Um, Lord, I'm so thankful to know a brother and to look up to a brother who's who's truly spending all of his time, talent, and treasure uh, for the sake of the Great Commission. We pray that you'll raise up many more gifted men uh, in that vein in the years to come, unless you should come back first. And we pray that you would in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you.